I'm going to start by telling you my credentials and how I know what I know, and then I'll go uh, into just some stuff that you might be interested in. Um, I hope you are. All right, so my, my name is Susan Rogers. I'm a PhD in uh, Program and Behavioral Neurosciences from McGill University. Um, prior to my PhD work, I worked in the music business. I started in, in L.A. in 1978. And uh, you can kind of look around the room and you can sort of tell that when it comes to pro audio, you don't see a lot of women <laughs> then and now. But there's more now than there were them. In 1978, you just didn't see women as recording engineers and record producers. And I actually didn't hold out the hope that I could ever be anything like that. But uh, there was one thing that I could do where my gender didn't matter. And that, of course, meant that I could repair the equipment. And so I did. I, I studied audio electronics, basic electronics, and electroacoustics, and magnetism, stuff like that. Anyway, I was repairing equipment, consoles, tape machines, in Los Angeles, California, in the late 70s and early 80s. In 1983, I was working for Crosby, Stills, and Nash as their studio tech. And I got a phone call that changed my life. Um, my favorite artist in the whole world, Prince, was looking for a technician. And I was one, and he liked working with women. So I got that gig, and I went to work for Prince in 1983, and he put me in the engineering chair. Um, I worked on Purple Rain, Around the World Today, the Parade Album, Sign of the Times, the Black Album, and then all the stuff that we did in between with The Time and Sheila E. And, uh, movies and being on tour and all these, all these things. And uh, I had a great time with him. I left him in 1988, exhausted, <laughs> but we did a lot of good work together. Paisley Park was built and now I could, uh, he could employ a different methodology and so could I. So I moved out to, back home to Los Angeles and I worked as a recording engineer for many artists. I worked as a mixer for others and I worked as a record producer for many others. Now, in 1998, before Napster and file sharing and all that, I had a, a big hit record with Bare Naked Ladies. We sold five million copies, which isn't considered a lot by people who do streaming today. But when you have to go into a store and buy a record and give someone money for it and carry it out, five million sales is a lot. So I got a big uh, royalty check, and then six months later, I got another one. That's how I used to work in the olden days. <laughs> <laughs> that we miss, some of us, although it was pretty bad too. Anyway, with that money, I entered college as a freshman at 44 years old, and I did eight straight years of college, psychology and neuroscience, and earned my PhD in music perception and cognition. From there, I came to Berklee College of Music in Boston, teaching in two departments, music production and engineering, but also teaching in liberal arts, psychoacoustics, and music cognition. So those are my, co my uh, credentials. Now what I'd like to talk with you about, because you're here, you're here learning about headphones and things, is the path, the signal processing path that's basically this long. It goes from your, oh, I just touched the microphone. It goes <laughs> from your eardrum to your auditory cortex right up here. It's this long. Every sound you've ever heard in your life, and will hear tomorrow, has to travel on that path. It would behoove us, if we're working in pro audio, to know what that's doing. So, you may know this, you may not, but uh, even if you know it, uh, it's fun. So I'll go through it. Pressure waves in the air are just air molecules are minding their own business. Nobody's bothering them. And they're dancing around in the little space. And I do anthropomorphize everything because that's a good way to memorize it. So they're just bouncing around and minding their own business. If they happen to be bouncing around in front of a loudspeaker and somebody goes and turns on an amp and sends current into that loudspeaker, that cone is going to push forward. And the little air molecules that are right in front of that cone are going to go, ah, eh, eh, because they're going to get shoved and slammed into each other. And then that cone is going to suck back the opposite direction, and they're going to go, ah, and they're all going to get pulled apart. Ask yourself sometime, what's in between air molecules? If you want to just blow your own mind. <laughs> anyway, 
Space. What? Nothing. There's nothing in there. <laughs> anyway, so there they go. They're forward and backward and forward and backward. And here goes this air pressure wave. If there's a microphone or an eardrum in the vicinity, the air pressure wave is going to enter your auditory canal. It's going to take your eardrum and it's going to move back and forth in that pattern. And that's going to be connected to the bones of your middle ear, the smallest bones in the human body. And they're going to go back and forth in that exact same pattern. And that's connected to the oval window of the cochlea. And it goes back and forth in the same pattern. In the cochlea, snail-shaped cochlea, it's filled with a really dense fluid. And they taught me when I was young that if you were to take a bath or try to in that fluid, you wouldn't be able to sink because it's really dense. It's filled with saline and lots of charged ions. So anyway, the pressure wave's going back and forth. And in that fluid, it's going to push that fluid back and forth, like in a fish tank. Now, running through the middle of that fluid-filled chamber is the basilar membrane. It's 35 millimeters long. There's its input stage. It goes to the final hand. And you know it's curled around cochlea shaped like a snail. Anyway, it's 35 millimeters long. That membrane, you can think of it kind of like a tongue. It's like your own tongue in that it's constant density, same material, but not constant pressure. It's really tight right here, really loose at its far end, wired and more loose. So what happens is, if you're listening to music, let's say, realistically, you've got energy from 50 hertz to 17K, pretty broad band. Your high frequencies are going to cause that membrane to go up to its highest point right here. <coughs> when you run out of energy, we all know high frequencies are weak. They can't travel very far. So the high frequencies are going to go up and down here, your mid frequencies here, and your, we know you all love that 808. Your low kick drum, that's from the band Outcast, the thing you have. I know y'all love that 808. So that, that, uh, that kick drum is going to sail all the way down the membrane and reach its maximum potential. This gets really good. <coughs> Sitting above the membrane is a single row of inner hair cells. Hair cells. And they're so called because they got it looks like little hairs on the top. And that's its nucleus, its single little eye. It's a single row, 3,500 of them. That's your analog to digital converter. The mechanical motion of that membrane going up and down is going to bounce these guys up and down. And then we little hairs at the top are going to go back and forth and back and forth because they're bathed in this thick fluid. So there's the membrane, there's the hair cell. It's going up and down and up and down. It gets better. The hairs have some little pores in them. And these are so small, two microns is the width of that little thing. Not even millimeters, microns. There's pores. If we were to play a 1,000 hertz sine wave in this room right now, we go like this, the membrane goes up and down. The hairs are connected to each other with little springs. They're called tip links. On one phase of the wave, the little hairs get all next to each other because the little springs compress. On the second half of the wave, they go in the opposite direction. The springs expand, and the pores open and close once per cycle. Closed, open, closed, open, and so on a thousand times a second. Which to us, a second is the shortest amount of time. I'll be there in a sec means I'll be there in an instant. To a brain, a second is a relatively long time. A thousand times a second. And what's happening is, any time these things expand and the pores open, charged ions in the fluid, sodium, potassium, and other things, calcium, come flooding in to this thing on half of every cycle. Once per cycle, I should say, half of every wave, right? The charged ions come flooding in. When they come flooding in, waiting at the bottom of each inner hair cell, these little round packets. Packets 
called vesicles that are holding neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitter that they hold is called glutamate. This is sitting there until it hears sound. When they get the go command from the ions coming in, the little vesicles attach themselves to the membrane at the bottom of the hair cell. It's happening in your body right now. It's happening in your inner hair cells. They attach themselves at the bottom and they release their contents into the synapse. They attach and they open up and they release those little neurotransmitters, that glutamate, into the synapse, waiting there. Let me try the purple one. Waiting there between three, uh, no, six and ten auditory nerves. They're waiting. When they get that glutamate, they fire an action potential, a spike. That's your analog to digital conversion. They start with analog mechanical motion, and what ends up going up the bundle of auditory nerves is spikes. Thousand times a second, a one or a zero. That works great, up to about four kilohertz. The inner hair cells, these living things, they can only do so much. They work really hard. By four kilohertz, that's as fast <coughs> as they can give you a spike once per cycle. Which is why on an 88 key keyboard, the highest <coughs> key is going to have a root pitch of about 4,300 hertz. We don't hear pitch very well above between 4 and 5k. Even if you hit the upper note on the piano, it's like dink, dink, dink. It doesn't really sound like a pitch. It's the best they can do. Anyway, those are your inner hair cells that are converting mechanical motion caused by the air pressure wave into an aggregate pattern of nerve spikes across two bundles of your wiring, your auditory nerve bundle on the left and on the right. So that's what happens to convert the pattern from mechanical motion into spikes distributed across the bundle in a very complex pattern. But then what happens is the, the nerves leave leaves the cochlea, goes to the uh, cochlear nucleus, goes up the chain, something called the superior olive, goes up the chain, something called the inferior colliculus. One on each side. When the signal gets here to the cochlear nucleus, there's just a crude analysis. It's not a very smart stage. It's you're dividing the signal up into the low frequencies, the mids, the highs. Then it goes up to the superior olive, and what's really cool there is that, remember, we've got one on each side. Superior all are very complex. That thing does is it's got coincidence detectors. So if you snap your fingers here outside your right ear, it's going to come in here in your right ear. And actually, our nervous system um, has decussation, meaning it crosses over. Your right hand is going to go primarily to your left hemisphere, left hand to your right, and so on. Nervous system crosses over. But you go like this, and your left superior all very complex is going to say, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Not send the signal up the chain until that pressure wave has moved around your head, gone into your opposite ear, gone to the opposite superior colliculus, um, and then they both arrived at the same time. When they both arrive at the same time, that's when the go signal is sent up the chain, and that's a coincidence detector. It detects when two things arrive at the same time. So if you take your finger and you touch the tip of your nose, it feels like it happens at the same time. You feel it in your finger, you feel it in the skin on your nose. But it doesn't. Because it would freak you out if you actually perceived reality. The reality is the signal from the nerve endings at the tip of your nose gets to your brain faster than this does. These nerve spikes have to go all the way up your arm and up your brain stem. So they go through a circuit that says, wait, wait, okay, now go. <laughs> and it's the same thing for your foot. When you ask people to tap their hands to a metronome in the lab, 
play it through speakers, play a metronome. You use motion capture technology, the special gloves with the sensors on it and camera. Tap your hand to the beat. The hand is ahead by about 30 milliseconds so that the sound will arrive coincidentally at the same time because it takes longer for it to come from your hand. That's 30 milliseconds. 50 milliseconds if you're asked to tap your foot. So our nervous system is processing what it hears and doing its job, which is to tell you what the truth is of the world. It often gets it wrong. It often gets it wrong. Anyway, there's your left-right coincidence detectors that are familiar with the computation to localize sound. Localize it if it's coming from loudspeakers out there in the world. Lateralize it if it's coming from headphones or in-ear monitors. That's the, the verb we use is lateralize because your ears are not involved. I'll get to the head-related transfer function in a moment. It leaves the superior olive, and from there it goes to our first smart processing stage, the inferior colliculus. It's smart because our wiring is bidirectional. We don't just send signal up the chain to the brain. It comes down from the brain. And the inferior colliculus had better be smart because it's getting input from two sources. It's getting the up the chain commands of what you're actually hearing and the down from the top of what you want to be hearing. So we were just talking a moment ago about Stevie Wonder and drumming. If you're listening to a Stevie Wonder track, how about Creep? He does that weird fill. <laughs> the top of Creep, you think, he's not going to get there in time. He's not going to get there in time. That fill is so odd. I love that. Once that fill happens and that song launches, you just want to keep your ear on those drums. You want to imagine Stevie in the studio. How are you doing that? Your cortex is saying, Stevie, I want Stevie on drums. Give me Stevie on drums. It sends a command down to these little guys, the left and right ones, and it says, tell, tell, tell the ears. Tell my ears. It's drums I want. The signal comes down and arrives at your cochlea. And then it gets even more amazing. Because in nature, sometimes things that we think are simple, and kind of simple-minded, kind of stupid, end up being amazing. So the signal comes down, comes down from the brain. And it goes from that nerve the hair cell, similar but different from the inner hair cells. This is your outer hair cell. And these are things, we've got about 12,500 of them, well, four times more than inner hair cells. That's your digital to analog converter. Patterns of nerve spike activity, on or off, one or zero, come to these things. When it gets there at the bottom, you know, arrive, here. When it gets there, this cell has a property that no other cell in all of nature has. No other cell in your body or in nature has. Something called electromotility. That little thing can expand and contract this little body, but it gets electrical input. You can do it in a petri dish. There's a funny video of a outer hair cell dancing to a Linda Ronstadt song, which makes me laugh because I imagine her in the vocal booth singing and imagining a hair cell listening. <laughs> That's funny to me. Anyway, think of the outer hair cells like taking a, a water balloon and only partially filling it with water and tying it off. You can compress it and expand it. They've got this fluid filled core that brings fluid in or pumps it out based on the input, the signal they're getting. What they then do is they touch a membrane with their little hairs. The inner hair cell doesn't touch anything. It's just in fluid. These guys are touching a membrane up above. Remember the basilar membrane is down below. So they're touching up above. And by expanding and contracting the little bodies, they can push and add energy 
to the frequencies that correspond to Stevie Wonder's drums, allowing you to home in and focus on his drums and suppress energy at the frequencies that correspond to his keyboards, his bass, and his vocal. So in this way, they're taking ones and zeros, nerve spike activity, converting it to mechanical energy. It's a two-way street. And it is amazing. I mean, they say in neuroscience that our auditory system is crude compared to vision. If you go to neuroscience conferences, it's all vision, 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 vision. That's the human thing. That's the great thing. Sound just has a little corner <laughs> over the side. But sound processing, you may not know this, but you might find it interesting. It's the fastest of our five senses. It's faster than vision. It's way faster. It's faster than touch. We all know you touch something hot, and you go to pick up your coffee mug, and then you go, Ha! <laughs> it's really hot. Pain takes a little while for you, to, for you to realize it. So touch takes a long time. Taste actually takes longer. Sound is the fastest. That happened for evolutionary reasons because you have eyes in front of your head that can tell you what's out there in the world. But if you hear a little rustling in the bushes behind you and you're an ancient human being, your ears better be smart enough to recognize whether that's a snake or a cheetah or your kid behind you. We don't close these. We can close our eyes. We can spit out a taste that we don't like. We can move our bodies away from a touch that we don't like. But your ears are always open. They're always on. And it's super fast processing. Anyway, uh, this two-way street of what you hear, what you respond to, the neural rewards that you get from listening to music that you love, this is more mind-blowing stuff, the neural rewards train your listening brain right here at the cortex, right at the end of that 35 millimeter long path, train your brain for what you like. And as a result, you get better and faster at recognizing the music of you, the music that you like. Because your auditory cortex has been shaped by its relationship to your dopaminergic reward system and its relationship to your muscles. We like the music that we like because of the interconnections between our auditory system, no particular order here, our motor system, and our reward system. There are thick neural tracks that connect these that are not present in monkeys, by the way. Monkey can't dance. They tried to teach monkey how to dance. They can't do it. Monkeys don't have the neural connectivity to extract a rhythmic pulse from music and synchronize their motor system to it. Humans can, and parrots can. Humans and parrots have something in common. We're vocal learners. We're vocal imitators. Humans and lyrebirds and African gray parrots, we've learned how to hear sounds, mimic those sounds with our voices. In order to do that, your auditory system has to be tightly connected to your motor system. Music comes in when this guy gets involved. When you hear, for me, Al Jackson Jr. on drums. When I hear the song I heard this morning, Isley Brothers, For the Love of You. Oh, <laughs> I gotta stop the car. I love it so much. That auditory pattern, that pattern, moves my body in the way that my body likes to move, which releases dopamine, which tells this system Yes, please, more of that. Give me more of that. I'm going to be on the, on, on the not lookout, but listen out for more of that. So your listening brain and mine, all of ours, is unique based on all the music listening experiences you've had in your life. I'm going to say some, a few more things. Uh, I'll, I'll, 
be excited. And I'll go on for too long. So let me make sure I tell you some of the things I thought people coming to CanJam might want to hear. But this is kind of important. There's your input right there, the shape of your penna. And we all know damn good and well, all we got to do is push this outward a little bit, pull it down, pull it up, move it ever so slightly, and what we're hearing changes. Your auditory brain has been shaped by this thing's shape. This weirdo shape with all these folds and ridges and all that. Half of us have attached lobes, the other half have freestanding lobes. It's unique to all of us. And as your body and your head have grown, your auditory system has grown accustomed to, when I hear this, it means that happened out there in the world based on this. When you're listening through loudspeakers, you've got a more realistic picture of what's happened out there in the world. Because when you put on headphones, you eliminate this as that input filtering stage. Our ears have been called a complex directional filter. This weirdo shape that we can't move. Horses can turn their ears forward or they can rotate them and look outward or backward. Rabbits can rotate their ears. We can't do that. So this weird shape evolved to help us process the most important sound in our world, which is by far human speech. The energy band that's important is the 1K to 4K region, because that's where the differences between speech consonants are. That's where the difference is between rat, bat, cat, sat, hat. If someone says, there's rats in that cave, if you think you hear there's hats in that cave, you'll be, oh, great, free hat. <laughs> and, and, and that's a problem. So you need to have the auditory processing power to tell the difference between the hat in hat and the R in rat. Rat, sat, similar, very different. Anyway, this is designed to amplify 1 through 4K. But this isn't shaped the same for all of us. Clearly, it's not. So what I wanted to share with you, and now I remember the guy's name, Simon Carlyle is his name. He plotted the head-related transfer function, eight people, I think it was. And I like to show my audio students this, because it tells them, oops, that's supposed to say 10 kilohertz. Careful, 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 careful. Because what happens is, imagine, Eight of these, um, eight of these lines. Head-related transfer function, by the way, is what this your head and the shape of your ears is doing to alter the sound that reaches your cochlea. It's unique to you. How unique, you might ask. So that's what Simon Carlyle looked at, and everybody goes along pretty much the same up to about 1K. They all go along up to about here. From there, you mess with this. One person might go, another person might go, like this. There can be as much as a 15 dB difference. At 5K, between two people with normal hearing, perfectly good normal hearing. One of them is going to hear a 10 dB boost at 5K. The other one's going to hear a 5 dB cut. So what I'd like to tell you is that when you are choosing headphones, do not choose them based on price or the reviews or what famous person uses them. Think of them as glasses or reading glasses. You need the corrective lens when you buy glasses that compensates for what your eyes lack. And likewise with headphones, recognize there's going to be a built-in average penna that filters something in here to represent the average, but the average is really different for people. There's even a book about it. There's no such thing as average. Everyone is some deviation from a theoretical average. So, when you put on headphones and you're listening, whether they sound good or bad to you has to do with whether or not they're boosting or cutting the frequencies that you're boosting and cutting. And you would, of course, want something that 
levels that out and boosts and cut, cuts the opposite of what you've got going on. Think of them like glasses and choose the headphones that are a good match for how you hear. Here's another little tip. This comes to us from the marvelous Richard King at uh, McGill University. I wish I'd known this. It's very smart. It's also very intuitive, but I'd never thought of it. When he's checking out loudspeakers, this guy won <coughs> a lot of Grammys. He works in classical music. He said, I never bring the best sounding music to check out speakers. I bring my worst mixes. I bring the mixes where I screwed up, and it's too bright or it's too dull. What a good loudspeaker is going to do is it's going to show me, yeah, you sucked on that one. <laughs> this sounds awful. I do not want a loudspeaker that's going to flatter me and tell me, oh, you're great, <laughs> when I know I'm not. So when you're checking out headphones, remember your unique head-related transfer function. Someone asked in the previous session, how can we objectively hear such and such? You can't. You can't any more than you can objectively see something or taste something. Your listening brain got that way based on your listening experiences. If you want objectivity, look at a spectrum analyzer. But everything is going to everything you hear is going to be filtered through your own unique listening experiences and your customers as well. There's something else I want to share with you. I won't keep you too much longer. I guess something else I want to show you. Um, you can Google this and try it out for yourself. If you Google analytic versus synthetic pitch, you'll get an audio example of what I'm about to talk about. I am a non-musician, like most people. Uh, I'm, I'm musical, but I'm not musically trained, like most people. Mm -hmm. Relatively few have formal music lessons. If you look for this, what you're going to hear is two two-tone complexes, one after the other. And uh, what you're going to hear is the voice of Alan Houtsma from the American Acoustical Society saying, uh, you will hear a pair of complex tones. Do you hear the pitch go up or down? The first tone you hear, it just consists of 800 hertz in one case, just two tones. It's followed by the second tone, which is, they leave the one kilohertz exactly where it is. They take the 800 component and they move it down to 750. And I ask students every semester, show me with your thumb if you hear the pitch go up <coughs> or down. And they're all there with their thumbs like this. And I'm there with my thumb like this. And inevitably, every semester, a student says, no, no, how do you hear it go up? And I say, how do you hear it go down? If you are an audio manufacturer or you sell pro audio equipment, know this. Formal music lessons, starting in childhood and lasting for at least five years or so, develop auditory athletes. The auditory path that I was talking about earlier gets fatter and thicker. Those little nuclei get fatter. They get more cells. The auditory nerves grow more branches. You become an auditory athlete. So my students can listen analytically. For the life of me, I can't. And I never will because past a certain age, your auditory system stops growing. If you're taking music lessons, it'll continue to hone. But if you're not taking music lessons, it's done by age 12. Anyway, what I hear is a 200 hertz component going up in pitch to 250. The spacing in between these two components, I hear and eh, and eh. And I have to sing it to my students because they don't hear that. With their super high ways of listening, they can hear that 800 hertz component go down to 750. I couldn't do that if my life depended on it. And I've listened to this thing dozens and dozens of times. They can even sing it to me. I can't hear it because I don't have the infrastructure like most people. So if you are testing audio equipment, make sure you got a, a, a non-musician as well as a musician or several to listen because they're going to hear different things. They have different, like, just, like, just like an athlete's body is optimized for taking in oxygen 
and converting it to energy. A non-athlete's body doesn't do that quite so efficiently. The reflexes on an athlete be stronger. The balance of their body is better. It's because the brain learns anything you do a lot, you get good at. So the brain says, okay, if you're listening a lot and you're hearing subtle differences in sounds, the brain thinks to itself, this guy must be really into this. <laughs> I'm going to grow some more stuff. Help him out a little bit here. And it does, and you become an analytic listener. The good news for the students is an analytic listener can learn to hear synthetically. But the synthetic listeners of a certain age, adults, will never learn to hear analytically. Just like you can't acquire perfect pitch as an adult. Don't believe those websites that say that you can. The clay is dry. <laughs> Anyway, um, when it comes to music, they got, those kids got the super hearing, good for them. But I can hear the whole record better than they can. Because I'm listening synthetically. I can understand the relationship among the parts because I'm not distracted by the little details. Big picture. Um, so anyway, that's just some of the tons of cool stuff that there is out there when it comes to hearing and our listening brains. Um, uh, if you like this kind of thing, I've written a book called This Is What It Sounds Like, which is about our listening brains. It's about what it sounds like to you, specifically what music sounds like to you. And uh, it's based on the perspectives of being a record maker, being a neuroscientist, being a non-musician. It's written for music lovers. And uh, in the book, uh, there's my doctoral advisor's book, This Is Your Brain on Music, and then uh, the great Nina Krauss at Northwestern has written Of Sound Mind. All of those are written for the lay person, and they're great if you like this sort of thing and you want to learn more about it. So thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. Thank you. In, in real life, how do you go about it? So you, you gave a good analogy of how, you know, in terms of your vision, you, you can you know, go to an eye doctor and they will give you different lens and you're able to say, okay, that's the perfect lens for me. But when you walk into a headphone store, or a, how exactly in real life do you do that? Yeah, you need to, I, I showed this in the other talk and I forgot to show you guys, but real quick. Uh, I talked about the inner hair cells, the outer hair cells, and so on. What audiologists are doing today are three tests. When you go to your audiologist, you'll get a hearing screening, a hearing test. And that goes from 125 hertz up to 8 kilohertz. Quick word of caution, they have extended frequency hearing tests that go up to 16K. One of my students developed tinnitus from that test, getting pinged at a high amplitude, with like 10K, 12K. Don't do it. I suggest you don't do it. Anyway, get a hearing test. If you've got uh, Apple AirPods and an Apple phone, the Apple Mimi, audiologists tell me, is just as good as going to the ear doctor at testing your own hearing. Don't test your own hearing every week. And I am going to answer your question. But um, test your hearing. They tell the students at Berkeley every semester, which would be every 15 weeks or so, a few times a year. Anyway, get a hearing test. The second test you want to get is an ABR, and that stands for Auditory Brain Stem Response. The auditory brain stem is that path I was talking about. It's the path that goes from the cochlea up to just above your ears. The auditory brain stem response is super simple. You go into the lab and you sit in the comfortable chair, and they stick the electrodes on you. It doesn't pierce the skin, it's like a band-aid. So they stick a ground one right here, and stick it there. If you'll feel behind your ears, there's a bone, like a bony shelf, and then there's a soft, a little bit of soft stuff underneath that bone. That bone is the mastoid bone. They stick, they, I, I've done it too with students at Berkeley, stick the, the electrodes right there on the mastoid bone, and that's picking up what's that soft stuff in there. That's your wiring. It's picking up your auditory brainstem wiring, your cochlear nucleus, your superior olive. It's picking up that. So you go to get the ABR and you sit in the comfy chair. They put the stick the electrodes on you, give the, the really expensive, anemotic in-ear uh, earbuds. 
close your eyes, lay very still, and they deliver to you the most boring sound, <laughs> a click stream, just tick, 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 for 90 seconds. And what that does, the researcher can see it on the screen. You see your A to D conversion. And you see the amplitude of the nerve sparks coming from your inner hair cells. If your inner hair cells are healthy, you can have a good healthy ABR in both ears. The third test that they do is DPOAE, and that's for our outer hair cells. Distortion product, auto-acoustic emission. You may not have known this, but sound is coming out of your ears. Not all the time, but if your ears are healthy, sound is coming out. What that means is your outer hair cells, it's a super high gain system, and sometimes they'll just start to oscillate a little bit in the region between 1K and 2.5K. It's below your threshold of hearing, you can't hear it. It's sound coming out of your ear. It's a sign of healthy outer hair cells. So they'll put the same, same gear, the, the electrodes just stick in here, earbuds, but special kinds of earbuds that have a, um, a little speaker in them as well. I mean a speaker and a microphone, rather. And the little speaker will ping your ears with a click at 85 dB SPL, just a tick, and it's going to cause healthy outer hair cells to start to oscillate. And the little microphone that's in the earbud is going to pick that up and show your outer hair cells are good. That's a comprehensive test that's going to tell you the health of your inner hair cells, the health of your outer hair cells, and the health of your hearing in general. You'll be able to see where you've got dips that are not in the normal range. Speaking of the normal range, you got to keep this in mind if you get a hearing test. It's 20 dB wide. So you could experience, you could be experiencing a loss of 20 decibels of sensitivity at 4K, and your hearing doctor would say you're normal. Not good. But that's why you don't want to test your hearing too often, because on another day when you're better rested and you've had a good night's sleep, maybe you weren't up the night before, for all hours of the night, your 4K might come back. It fluctuates. So get the hearing test, and if you get those other two screenings, that'll, that'll also tell you a lot about the health of your hearing system. And you'll know if the one ear is a little bit you know, off compared to the other. You'll know. But your brain, remember, is constantly compensating for these things. You may know the name of the great mix engineer, Andrew Sheps. Andrew Sheps is famous. Uh, he's from my generation. He's a little younger than me. but. He's famous among my generation of engineers for mixing on headphones. My generation, we didn't do that. It was bad. Oh, it's bad. The youth of today are mixing on headphones. Anyway, Andrew Sheps does. And um, he and I and others, the great Chad Blake and others, have talked about hearing loss as a function of age. But remember the triangle I drew earlier? Your auditory system. If you did a lot of critical listening when you were young, it knows what stuff should sound like. And older engineers, including Chad Blake, whose hearing is pretty damaged by his own admission, are still great mixers because their brains are sending that signal down to their outer hair cells, telling their cochlea to behave a certain way. They're compensating for what they know their system is lacking. We can do this in this business, but be really careful and don't uh, be careful of noise induced hearing loss. Don't don't overexpose your, your hearing. Yes. So as a follow up to that, are the inner hair cells, I guess, disconnected from the outer hair cells? So if the inner hair cells, inner ear cells die, but the outer hair cells are still there, will you still get the triangle effect with mm, dopamine? That's a good. That's a good question. Hair cells don't grow back. Right. Once they're dead, they're dead, and they don't they don't come back. Birds. In birds, they go Special back, but case. not in humans. Actually, they're adjacent to each other. So you'd have one inner hair cell, like right here, a single row, and then next to it, you'd have the my hands are doing a bad job. Next to it, you'd have like three or four, and in some places, five outer hair cells. They're not connected to each other, but they're they're adjacent. Okay. Yeah. When we lose our hearing, it's the outer hair cells that are the first to go, and that's why. If you're losing your hearing, you'll say to people, stop 
shouting, I can hear you, I can't understand you. The pushing and pulling action of the outer hair cells amplifies the frequencies we need to pay attention to. And as I said before, what we need to be paying attention to is that 1K to 4K region, which just happens to be the region that's the first to go. So they're amplifying there. If they're dead and gone, you can hear people talking. You've got all those low frequencies, you got those low mids, you can hear. But you can't tell the difference between rat, cat, sat, bat, hat. The speech consonants, those upper mids, that's what you've lost. Um, they're, they're, that's acting as our, they're acting as our compressor and very important. They help us detect speech and noise and uh, echo suppression and all sorts of things like that. Other questions? Well, I do go on a long time and I've kept you, but thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. Thank you.